Thanks for tuning in. I'm Ben Aston, and this is the Digital Project Manager Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Natalie Semchuk, one of our resident DPM experts at the Digital Project Manager. Natalie, thanks so much for coming on the show again. We're welcoming Natalie back, I think, for the third time. Hello, nice to be here. <laughs> Good stuff. So today, we're talking about communications. And we all know that communication is a really important part of our role. But what are the tools that we can use to be better at it? One of, the, one of those tools is a communications plan. And if you've ever found that your clients are constantly harassing you for information, or vice versa, it might be that maybe you're the one harassing them for information, uh, and it's all getting a bit awkward, then you're in luck because we've got a tool that we're going to talk about today that can help fix all that. It's the communication plan. But first, let me talk about Natalie. Well, let me introduce her properly. So Natalie is a digital project manager who's actually just gone full time. This is a big deal for Natalie. Uh, she, she's a remote project manager in Arizona and uh, was doing freelance gigs, but now has gone full time. Uh, she also has her own newsletter, which you should check out, DPM-ish, and uh, her PM Reactions blog, uh, so check all those out. But as one of our DPM experts, Natalie is also going to be making an appearance in our upcoming course, Mastering Digital Project Management. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, but you know you need some PM training, uh, go and check it out. It's a seven-week crash course. And it includes some interactive video lessons, uh, assignments, group discussions, and webinars. And there's also the option of coaching sessions as well. So head to digitalprojectmanagerschool.com and get yourself signed up. And uh, you'll find Natalie on there. But Natalie, tell us about... uh, Actually, the first thing I want to (laughs) to ask you about is your DPM-ish newsletter. We haven't we haven't received one for months. What happened? <laughs> oh man, I was worried I would be called out on this. Um, <laughs> so as you mentioned, um, I recently took a full time job, and I kind of was taking a break after the holidays to revamp the newsletter, kind of put a, a longer term plan in place for the kind of content and topics we wanted to cover. Um, you know, guest guest editors and things like that. And then in the midst of all of that, um, I got a full time job. So. Between uh, kind of between that and the freelance that I still take on, um, you know, in small amounts on the side and just getting used to everything, um, it's taken a little longer to get that plan in place. But I promise a new DPM will be coming out soon. And we actually just passed the one year mark of it existing. So I definitely want to keep that going. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Good stuff. And tell me, I'm interested though, because you were one of our, I feel like, one of the poster child for uh, for remote <laughs> freelance PMing. So, so now, uh, with your transition to a full time role, um, yeah, what what kind of made you decide to take the leap or the plunge back into, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> away from freedom? And back to being tethered. No. So, you know, I still work remotely, which I super love. Um, It definitely gives me the sense of freedom, too, in terms of, you know, I'm literally wearing pajama bottoms right now. And no one would have known if I hadn't said that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) No, but I I was kind of feeling so I freelance for five years full time. And I was starting to feel, um, you know, when I started, I was pretty junior. And I spent a long time learning the ropes and taking risks kind of on the projects I was working on. And I just felt like it was time to challenge myself a little more. Um, I love, I love what I do freelancing. I loved it. Um, It was really fun, but I was also starting to get kind of burned out with the, the one um, project contracts, which were um, kind of how a lot of agencies do things. You know, they need relief on a project you get a project and then you're in and out. Um, So yeah, I was just getting a little bit frustrated that when I worked with such great teams or, um, you know, a new process, I couldn't really contribute in a lasting way other than just on my project. And the successful relationships I've had freelancing um, that I've enjoyed the most have been longer term. So I just wanted to start thinking more about that and exploring the chance to maybe um, almost take a breather and focus on my own development as well as investing in a team. Cool. So what kind of... um... Yeah, what kind of projects or agency kind of lured you into full time then? What are you what are you working on right now? Uh yeah, so that's actually kind of interesting. I in the past when I freelanced, I would do a lot of, you know, projects uh start to finish building. So 
redesign, development, launching a site. The current position I'm in is more like post-launch um, project management, maintenance, support. And I really love it. I spent the last few years uh, specifically giving talks on sort of po- post-launch maintenance, how to build a site with that kind of thing in mind, thinking about how the client's going to use you know, the content that we're giving them on the site, um, all of the sort of modules or um, you know, fields or things like that in the back end. And that's sort of exactly what I'm doing now. So I uh, help transition projects from build projects into that post-launch maintenance phase. And we kind of take on, um, you know, any additional features that didn't make it into like phase one. So I'm actually, you know, the mystical phase two. I'm the phase two. (laughs) The phase two is actually happening. Yeah, yeah, it actually exists. uh, Come to find out. Who knew? Um, But no, I really love it. And it's been great because it's a really cool way to get to know a client longer term um, and being able to be fully, fully invested in their success after launch. I don't know that a lot of places really dedicate someone full time to that. So it's been really cool to be able to help them sort of fulfill that vision and, you know, jump on updates that are security based or things like that and really help the long term health of the site. Mm. So what are the in, in that transition then from uh, freelance to uh, to full time? What what have been the challenge? What well, can you share any, any of the challenges that you found? um actually going back to full time yeah. how how's that how's that been um so honestly the first thing that surprised me the most was a positive i was just shocked how many people were there to support me onboarding because i'm so used to being the contractor added to a team where i'm you know i'm like a a one person army i'm like hey i need access to this hey my contract needs to be updated and you know, when I was actually onboarding with this company, people were like, how are you doing? Do you need more training? I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> so it, it was uh, shocking in a way because I just hadn't experienced that in so long. But I think the biggest challenge is just sort of um, the pace and volume are very different. You know, it's not my company. It's not mm-hmm. my future. And in my own hands, it's, you know, the company um, that I work with uh, is trying to succeed. So um Yeah. So the pace, you know, the volume is a lot bigger. When I was freelancing, I only had time for like maybe four to six projects on my plate at once um, a year. And, you know, of course, especially in maintenance mode, I have a lot more clients now, but they also have a very different pace. And it was a pace that I wouldn't be able, you know, to support myself with if I was freelance. Um, Yeah. So that's been a challenge. And I think also uh, communication wise, you know, I'm working with one company. So we do a lot of video meetings and things like that, which is really amazing. But I freelanced for you know a long time where it was just me and I maybe checked in with teams in person sort of on video a few times a week. So I've realized I maybe should make more of an effort with my parents. Um, but, but no, it's been really <laughs> great. And I think it's interesting to get to a point where I am invested in a team. Um, but at the same time, because we're all remote, we have really nice boundaries with our personal lives. Um, you know, like work, work and, and personal time bleed into each other, of course, but we're much more respectful of each other because mm. we can just sort of step away, which has been great. And with freelancing, you don't really get that because, you know, working is life. So it's nice to, to have a little bit of a balance again, or finding that for myself. Yeah. And have you, so obviously when, whenever you're starting at a new agency, there's new processes and systems and tools. Has there been anything in the new agency that you've been like, oh, this is awesome, that these guys have got something figured out really nicely that you hadn't encountered Definitely, before? yeah. So it's been really great. Um, the person I I work with and support, the other PM, she has so many amazing processes for documentation. So it's a very structured way of you know meeting with a client, kind of figuring out what's going on, having a really solid process in our project management tool, um, and then documenting it all back to them. And I found myself, um, so I I still have a small freelance gig on the side. And I found myself like bringing that back to my freelance that um, still exists and saying like, oh my gosh, I could be writing so much more documentation, essentially. Um, And it's been great to sort of see that in action. I think the other thing is, the team is very senior. And seeing you know, developers and designers sort of um, take on those leadership positions too is really awesome. And it takes a load off of my plate and allows me to focus more on like refined communications and, you know, strategic things for clients, which has been really awesome. 
That's cool. And what uh, are there any any tools that they use? I mean, you talked about documentation, but are there any tools that uh, they they use there that you haven't seen or used before that you think, oh, that's cool that other people yeah, should know? Yeah, you about? know, um, so uh, we use Teamwork. I've never used Teamwork before, but I understand it's a pretty big player in the in the space and. I think it's nice um, only in that it's sort of all encompassing in terms of how we use it. So that's the other thing I'm, I'm kind of, yeah. you know, I'm a huge proponent of how to communicate while you're working remotely and everything we do goes into teamwork, which has been really, really helpful, not just in onboarding, but you know, I've had some sick time. I've had some vacation since I started and being able to have everything documented in one place, even if I'm covering for someone else too, makes a huge difference. And I was just so pleased to see that because it's something that I've definitely found as a pain point. Um, you know, in, in past experiences, especially onboarding to a singular project in an agency, if that's not documented anywhere, it's super difficult to get on board. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's one, it's one of the uh, things that we actually talk about in the, uh, in the Mastering Digital Project Management course. There's this challenge between, yeah, you can have the kind of best in class tools out there, but um, having that single source of truth and actually one tool that might not be the most awesome at everything but uh, it kind of ties everything together nicely. Um, I think it's, a, it's actually really beneficial, especially if you're trying to onboard people onto a project and, and they're like, you know, well, you know, from, from the team who's got the experience and they know, oh yeah, well, this kind of discussion always happens in Basecamp and this kind of discussion always happens in Slack and we save these files here on Dropbox. It's like, unless you unless you know all those things, it's really hard to get, to get up exactly. to speed on them. So it's interesting when those kind of, yeah, those, you know, one tool to rule them all <laughs> um, tools kind of actually work. And there's some good ones out there, but they're just typically not as pretty or as well liked yeah. <laughs> overall. So it's good good to hear yeah, that some of them are working. Yeah, and I think you've got the key is like not all tools are going to be pretty or, or work perfectly, you know, in all of the kind of all of the places it's hitting. But as long as you have that consistency and are actually using it, that's really the key. <sighs> Absolutely. So today we are talking about communication plans. And uh, so Natalie, for those that haven't read your awesome article yet, which is full of practical, helpful tips. So if you haven't read it, go and read it. Uh, but what is a communication plan? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, actually, while I was writing this article, I was like Googling all over kind of reading about other people's takes on project communication plans, too. Um, and I think really yeah. in the end, the essence of it is that it just defines um, how communication will take place over a project, um, what that structure looks like, what the frequency is, who's saying what, when and where. So really just kind of a massive expectation setting for the communication itself. So it's not necessarily, you know, milestone or deliverable base. It's actually how you'll be communicating um, the progress or issues or questions within a project and and really helping your team, but also your client understand that expectation. Mm. And I think, yeah, I think there's some, it's one of those artifacts, isn't it, from kind of traditional project management, mm -hmm. that as digital project managers, we can be a bit like, oh, like documentation, that's not cool. Um, or, uh, you know, we can, we can turn our noses up a bit, I think, sometimes about these kind of Sure. things that, like these pieces of documentation which just sound like they're just lots of work and documentation for documentation's sake but um yeah what's kind of what's your take on that i'm interested like what do you put in the uh, the communications plan to make it actually something that's useful and not just another piece of documentation that's describing the same thing that you described in 10 right. other pieces of yeah you know i like to think of it as sort of well one a very flexible document and like you said it's sort of an artifact kind of left over from more formal um, types of project management methodologies, but it's definitely something that is so, so useful regardless of, you know, the size of your project, the way you project manage, anything like that. So I look at it as sort of um, twofold. So something that I can look back on to remind myself what I need to be doing for this project. So first and for more, for, foremost, I like the idea of having something for myself because Obviously, I'm, I'm probably on, you know, multiple projects at any given time, and I'm sure most project managers can relate to that. So I think it's very helpful to be able to kind of know exactly when you should be communicating with your team or your client and 
how that is. And then on the other side, you know, yeah. your client is probably not super familiar with how any of our project processes work, uh, regardless of what industry they're in or how much they've worked with you. And there's always a little bit of that risk and uncertainty when they're giving you a bunch of money to do a thing that they don't know how to do. So it kind of helps alleviate that stress and pain and gives them a way to also structure mm -hmm. anything they, they need to tell, you know, their team, their board, their manager, you know, the people helping with the work on their end, all of that. So you have a really nice two way street of, you know, how you're going to be communicating and what you need to do and also what your stakeholders need to expect and who they need to bring in on that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's an important aspect of it, isn't it? The fact that it is a two way street. So we can make this as much as it's defining uh, what we're going to do. So as much as it's defining, you know, who we're going to communicate with, how often, what we're going to send them, uh, when we're going to send it. It's also saying to the client, we can include within that, hey, and this is what we expect from you. So you need to tell us certain things at certain times. You need to give us certain information at certain times too. So communication, you know, it's a two-way street. It's not just about the communication plan. is isn't just a, us about, you know, when we're going to shout. It's also, okay, how how is this conversation going to happen? And that ensures that, that the client has mm -hmm. a responsibility too. So if they... If they need to, you know, if there's information that we require from them, um, you know, updates on things being delayed or the timeline or whatever it could be from their side, uh, we can include that within the, the communication plan too and hold them accountable. It and is. I and I think it also gives you that too. added bonus of it's almost like, you know, like a, an, an emergency phone tree or something like that, right? It gives you an understanding of like who to go to when and that's a, I, th I don't know if that's a stretch to kind of compare, but in terms of the communication plan, like it gives you a place to um, reference if things come up. Like if I am on vacation and, you know, someone's seeing my project, they can look at, at the project communication plan and say, okay, I know that, you know, we expect to have these sorts of meetings and we are hitting a milestone this week. And so I need to do that. Um, same with if you have a new stake stakeholder onboarding onto a project, um, you know, from your client team, or if you work internally from your internal team, they can look and see, oh, okay, this is what to expect. So it's another level of that documentation for the things that, um, you know, strangely enough, uh, kind of bring the conversation around documentation, but you don't always document how those things happen. So it's a really good place to, you know, understand that communication within a project. Yeah. And so, and how do you actually use them then? Because I think um, it, it's one thing to create a piece of documentation <laughs> and uh, there's lots of pieces of documentation that as PMs we can feel like are a good idea. And then we, you know, create a piece of documentation and then file it away in a folder somewhere and think, hooray, I did it. Uh, but how do you, yeah, how do you think the best way is that we can use mm -hmm. communication yeah, that's a, to make that's a great point. Um, useful? I, I would say uh, sharing it with the team. So your team on the project um, is really important. So it kind of gives them an idea of what the communication uh, like schedule or cadence is, regardless of their, if they're involved in those things. It's good for them to have some contextual understanding of like how frequently you're meeting with a client or how frequently your client is going to be checking in or any of those things. So sharing it with your team kind of helps give them that understanding. Um, I think depending on the project, definitely sharing it with your stakeholder or client. Um, I only say depending on the project because it might be a case where, you know, you might need this more internally just because the client is, uh, or the project is sort of like a, a difficult situation to grasp, to grasp. So you might have an internal guide, but I would always recommend um, sharing something expectation wise and with communication with your client, because then they can also flag, Oh, you know, I also kind of need like a weekly update versus like a milestone based update because my supervisor has meetings with me weekly and I want to report on progress or something like that. So you can help alleviate their needs. Yeah. So, so yeah, all of that, all of that yeah. sharing really makes a difference. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. And I think it can be really helpful uh, as, to do this mm -hmm in the project initiation phase. So like when we're first meeting with our client, I think it can be great to create a communications plan upfront. Um, and then kind of in that, 
in that kind of initial meeting that you have with the client where you talk about, okay, how are we going to work together? How are we going to make this work? Actually, one of the first things that you can collaborate on together is a communications plan where you find out, okay, well, who do I need to, you know, who do I need to say what to, when, what kind of information do they need? Um, what's going to be useful? What's not going to be useful? Um, and actually, it can be collaborating with the client yeah. on producing the communications plan. Um, I think it's a really great way to to get that feeling mm-hmm. that you're partnering together, that you're on the same team, and uh, and that you know that it also gives you a way of you know we don't want to be like having to send the client loads of stuff all the time because you know it can be a lot of work. But if we do it right at the beginning of the project. And we kind of manage their expectations there. Um, it means it's it's if they then later on in the project say, oh, by the way, I actually need every week a full breakdown of everyone's hours and the tasks that they did and all of this extra reporting. We can say, mm-hmm. oh, well, we didn't agree that upfront. That will be a change request because the the reality is communication is good, but it comes at a cost. <laughs> so that kind of level of service level agreement, if we can agree that upfront for the project, uh, I think it can it can help alleviate those problems down the road when the clients start getting nervous and then they start asking for loads of information and data <laughs> that probably they're not actually using a lot of the time, but it's more just to give them a feeling of of confidence. That's so true. That's such a good point. It really um, it can really help define those boundaries. Essentially, I think what you're saying, which makes you know it makes sense. You document project scope requirements, things like that. Doing the same with communication totally makes sense. So have you got any stories of, uh, yeah, of, I mean, do you, let's be honest, do you always use a a communications plan? Have you got any stories where you haven't used one and things haven't gone quite to plan? Oh, for sure. And I think, (laughs) um, you know, much like I'm sure many people kind of listening will be able to relate. It's, it's wonderful to be able to say to do these things. And then, you know, reality hits and like, you're lucky to even be documenting tasks in the project. So I definitely understand um, how that works and how that feels. And I, I learned about project communication plans, honestly, like much of my project management upbringing uh, the hard way. Uh, (laughs) So I think in the article, I talk about a situation I had with a client where um, things were just a, a kind of a, a big mess, but it didn't present itself as a big mess until it was sort of too late. There are a lot of really small flags throughout the beginning of the project. Um, things like the client not uh, being very responsive after the kickoff, even though we knew it was like a go, go, go project. Uh, they just weren't answering emails or, or uh, responding to the needs that we had in order to start a project. So we were kind of blocked instantly. We also... Um, had a lot of instances where I was just sort of ghosted on uh, check-in calls, which, uh, <laughs> you know, it isn't, I mean, it isn't the greatest thing knowing that your client isn't there to, to check in. And um, yeah, so, so quite a few things like that, um, pushing off meetings, canceling meetings, but still the expectation of sticking to a schedule like was surfaced to me, like after all of those meetings were missed and things like that. So it was sort of a slow roll towards, massive red flag. And at first, I mean, I was so busy. I was sort of like, okay, like they know that they're postponing it. So it must be fine. Um, and then it started dawning on me, like, we just have no cadence, like regardless of what we have in our calendars, there's really no expectation of, of where this is going and how we're communicating. And my client or my, uh, my stakeholder definitely can't be getting what they need because I'm not getting what I need. So yeah. yeah. So yeah, in that case, for sure, um, a project communication plan would have made a massive difference and given me the structure initially to be able to say, hey, here are these boundaries and we're not hitting any of these things where we should be. And this is a red flag from the start. So that would have helped me a lot. Um, And now, currently, I try to at least put together something on my own side. Um, Internally, whether whether I share it with a client or not, I think it's really, really helpful to at least know, you know, per client, per project, the amount of communication that's right for them and what they seem to not just need, but want um, in terms of, you know, reporting or checking in on phone or video or email or anything like that. So typically I won't have like a full document for every client, but I try to at least outline it, you know, from the start, in a living message or document where we can refer to that 
you know, once every few meetings to say, hey, are we like still targeting all of these communications that we need? And if not, let's add or remove some. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think one of the uh, yeah, one of the temptations can be it's kind of like what, what you're talking about. One of the temptations can be that we're like, OK, well, I'm not actually going to formalize this mm-hmm. because then I have to be held accountable to it. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'll just go, I'll just kind of. I'll, uh, I'll, I kind of have my own plan in the background, but I'm not going to tell the client because then if I tell the client and then I don't do it, they're going to be like, where's that thing you promised? Mm-hmm. But I think actually the, um, for me, one of the great things about the communication plan is that it does hold us accountable. There is this, there is this, it, it, and sometimes when there's bad news, like it forces us to share bad news um like there's a cadence yes. for sharing news <laughs> and so it it forces us because sometimes we can be like oh I think this thing might be going wrong but do you know what I'm just going to wait a couple of days I'm not going to send a status report exactly. just yet just to see how this thing kind of works out over the next couple of days and then those couple of days become a week and we still mm-hmm. haven't updated the client and we're like uh now actually yeah it's gone quite bad <laughs> and, yeah. and if we'd have just bit in the bullet and be like oh well I have to send my status report on Friday because that's when the client's expecting it and I'm gonna have to tell them that something's going wrong Um, so I think it's a good tool for managing risk as well and that kind of accountability aspect of it hugely yeah and I think there's a tendency I'm sure we've all seen like with our team members too where if something's kind of off track if you know a design or development isn't totally going right um but maybe, you know, whoever we're working with kind of gives it another day and another day, like waiting to flag it, just hoping that it works out. I definitely have talked about this about in respect to remote work. Like there's a huge tendency, I think, for people in remote work, like the first, um, your first knee jerk reaction, if someone's like, you know, this thing is super overdue, what's happening? And you just uh, go dark. And it, well, <laughs> <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> Ben, I feel like I've done that to you on an article or two in the past. And I'm, very sorry. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm full body blushing here, but it is, it is a thing. And I think that, you know, it, it's, you're always kind of like, oh crap, they noticed deer in headlights. And if you hope that they, they don't notice until we you get <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, when in fact you're actually I'll just in the headlights. Keep my head down. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's exactly that, that total principle in project management where, um, you hope things get back on track, but you want to be, you know, saying it when it's a small issue rather than like a big gaping hole, uh, because they're expecting to be updated. And then you give yourself that expectation setting of like, okay, they're going to be a little nervous, but that's kind of good because that means they might be expecting something more. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's good. So ultimately though, this is all about managing expectations and um, yeah, and partly managing risk as well. So I'm interested just to like touch on what other tools, um, you know, in terms of managing expectations, are there any other tools or things that you do as well as a communications plan to, to manage expectations with a client on an, on a kind of formal or an informal basis? For sure. And I think um, a lot of these are rooted in that, like, the the kind of like documentation heavy project management style. And honestly, I think you touched on it earlier, like actually having those things in place and then following them and holding yourself accountable is so, so important, even though it might feel like too formalized or a lot of overhead, it gives a structure to all of the things that we need to be managing. So I love, um, I have like my own kind of weekly budgeting template for clients and it kind of varies depending on the project or the client. But I like to send them, especially if I have a weekly check-in meeting or monthly or whatever, a couple of days before that meeting regularly, um, a budget and status update. So that status update might be um, talking about, uh, you know, how many items have been completed this sprint and what we're on track to doing and how that compares to the last sprint. Or it might be something like, um, you know, these are all of the tasks currently open, like if it's a support project. And and this is what's waiting on you for review. And this is what's already been completed. So kind of just a, a breakdown so they can see at a glance where things are, especially if they're too busy, if we're, you know, sharing the project management tool or something, and they're too busy to, to gather that. Um, I think we've also talked about racing matrices or matrices. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have to be correct here uh, yeah. on, on the site as well. So that's a big one that's really helpful. And it's sort of like the project communication plan where you think like, oh, I might not need something so formal, but 
it really does help hammer out the responsibilities of everyone involved in a project. And it, the benefit of those kinds of things is that it flags or raises any issue that you aren't necessarily seeing when you're looking at it informally. It gives you an understanding of what can and can't be defined within the bounds that you're giving it. And in those cases, you either decide we need to go further and actually make these things defined, or we need to change the bounds that we're defining within. So yeah, those are kind of the, the main Good things stuff. that I like to use. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. So yeah, so if you haven't tried using a communications plan and you're wondering uh, why your client is always on your case, <laughs> or if you wonder why your client's not <laughs> responding, try a uh, communications plan. And helpfully, Natalie, it's not just we're not just talking about this. We've actually got a template. Uh, so head to the digitalprojectmanager.com uh, and just search there for communications plan template, and you're going to find it really quickly. Uh, so try using it, and you'll find that actually it helps you a lot. But Natalie, thanks so much for joining us. It's been great having you with Thank us Thank you today. so much. It's been wonderful being here again. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, if you'd like to contribute to this conversation about communications plan, uh, comment on the post and also head to the resources section of the digitalprojectmanager.com uh, to join our Slack team. And you're going to find more than a thousand other DPMs there and all kinds of interesting conversations going on. So you should be a part of it and go and check it out. But until next time, thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>